and there'll be no talk. But uh, on the following Tuesday, Tuesday Johanna Yarig will give a talk uh, with the title, People Prefer Moral Discretion to Algorithms, Algorithm Aversion Beyond Intransparency. And then on Friday, February 10th, Sergei Pollan, <laughs> physics here, will give a talk on the topic of quantum nanowires, a case study on reproducibility of natural science. And I have a sense he, he's got some really uh, uh, firsthand uh, um, understanding of the problem because it, it's what he works on as a physicist. Okay, today it's my pleasure to uh, welcome formally uh, Dan Burston from the nth to come and give a talk here. No, no, no. Second or third. Oh, okay, second or third time. Good. Um, uh, let, me, let me say just a little bit about him. He has his PhD in philosophy and cognitive science from the University of California at San Diego, where he won the Chancellor's dissertation medal, which he is not wearing. Did you, <laughs> you hocked it already? Is that yep. You know, four bucks, I got for it. Ten, ten. Um, he is presently associate professor in the philosophy department at Tulane uh, University. He works, as you may know, in philosophy of neuroscience, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of psychology. Uh, he has published prodigiously uh, and has mastered the art of the titles to papers. There is a very simple rule of three. You almost always have three things. So his forthcoming papers include things like Bayes, predictive processing, and the cognitive architecture of motor control. And it's the three together that bring closure to it and make it an enticing and satisfying title. And don't read the paper. Um, <laughs> okay, um, he's not just an associate professor uh, at Tulane. Um, he's a member of the Tulane Brain Institute and also director of the Tulane Cognitive Sciences uh, Program. Most important for us, uh, we're welcoming him back. Uh, he was a fellow in the Center for Philosophy and Science in the spring of 2019, and he is a fellow again this term, and it's a delight to see him back. He will speak to us on the topic of... Oh, it's that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, John. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, as always, it's a complete pleasure to be here at the Center. Uh, it's a, a place I've grown to... Uh, deeply love, uh, always learn it's on here, having some sort of interesting conversations here. Uh, so I hope uh, this will at least be interesting to everyone. Uh, I should also say, I'm sorry for changing the subject of my talk last minute. I had this sudden realization that I was planning to give my most philosophy of mind talk in this august place for the philosophy of science. Um, and that was kind of uh, some combination of lazy and dumb because I was working on the other talk anyway. Uh, so uh, this weekend, uh, I got I got together this this talk, which I hope will be of more general interest. Uh, and the, the subject today is scientific representation. So uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce very briefly to those who may not be uh, familiar with it, uh, some of the problems in the literature on scientific representation. Just to be upfront, I take a broad view of what representation is. So this includes standard we talked about scientific models, but also a range of other uh, representational devices like diagrams and other such things. Uh, I've been working on an account uh, uh, on my own and also with a collaborator uh, about how scientific representation works. So I'm going to give you uh, an overview of that account. And then the thing I really want to get onto is what I think the payoff of this account is. And this is for understanding kind of the role of scientific representations in scientific practice and understanding some of the complexity of, of scientific explanation through a view of how scientists represent and understand phenomena. So that's what we'll be doing today. Uh, just a little bit of quick background. This project goes all the way back to when I was a grad student like an embarrassing number of years ago now or getting there. So uh, I was a member uh, of this group started by my uh, PhD advisor, Bill Bechtel, and his spouse and collaborator, uh, Adele Abramson, and also with my buddy, Ben Sheridos. Uh, and we got this small NSF grant to study diagrams. So Bill had this nice thought that diagrams are so important in biology and they had received virtually no philosophical attention. So we got this small grant, basically it allowed me to not TA for a year um, so that I, we could do this project. Uh, another fun part of this is, is Ben is a bit of a heavy metal guy. 
So he somehow convinced Bill and Adele that we should name the group the Working Group on Diagrams in Science or War Gods. <laughs> um, I still don't know how he slipped that through. Um, but what we did in this project, it was a very open-ended project because so little work had been done on this philosophically. We went into a particular science, uh, the field of chronobiology or circadian biology. And we collected over 2,500 diagrams Database them, tagged them, categorized them, then realized we weren't digital humanities people and didn't really quite know what to do with that gigantic database. Uh, but some philosophical projects did come out of it. And one of the things that happened when I was doing that project was I started reading this literature on scientific representation. And one of the things that occurred to me was that I thought the accounts were just pretty povetous in a lot of ways. They they lacked the, the resources to explain. The, the richness and the dynamics of what we call representational practice of constructing, employing, sharing scientific representations. So a lot of uh, this project, which I've been fumbling around with for many years now, dates back to trying to address some of that dissatisfaction and generalize it to a broader case of scientific representation, including models and so forth. Okay, so uh, let's jump right in. Quick potted history of the debate on scientific representation. There's a few problems that we might uh, be worried about in the case of scientific representation. One is a set of semantic problems, which is just what does a scientific representation represent and how does it come to do so? Right. So we can think of this as a kind of semantic question about how a representation gets its meaning or its content. Well, we can also ask a range of epistemic questions. How does employing scientific representations allow us to gain knowledge about the world? And this can come in a variety of different forms. How does it allow us to generate true or accurate beliefs about the world? Or how does employing a representation contribute to epistemic practices like scientific explanation? I'm going to be talking more about the latter today. And there are a couple of really you know, widely noted problems in thinking about scientific representation. One is the problem of idealization. So uh, everyone admits or everyone should admit that scientific representations are highly idealized and abstracted from their representational targets, the things in the world they purport to be about. So how do we gain this knowledge about a particular system in the world from employing this representation, which is highly idealized and abstracted with respect to that system? Uh, a less widely noted problem, but I think a problem that's really interesting uh, and so this comes out of some of uh, Frigg and Nguyen's recent work. Uh, they call it the problem of style. And this is the problem of why there are just so many diverse and diffuse types of representation in science. If you read a biology paper, you'll see 11 different kinds of visualizations, for instance. Um, if you read a theoretical biology paper, you'll see a variety of different kinds of models employed in different ways. W what explains that diversity? Why is that diversity there? Why are there so many different forms of representation? This really struck me because it was one of the things that really struck me when I was going through that incredible backlog of diagrams that we constructed all of those years ago. So here's a brief rundown of extant theories. I'm not gonna go through these in any detail. If you've got one you really like, a reversion thereof, I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A. Um, I wanna get onto our positive view. First is a class of views that I call referentialist accounts. And these views say that X represents Y in virtue of some substantive relationship between X and Y. So the two that are usually offered are similarity or isomorphism. So X represents Y, X is similar to Y in relevant respects. Um, the basic, most basic kind of flat-footed versions of these are not taken, are not considered really strong candidates anymore. They face a lot of problems with these problems of abstraction and idealization. So modern versions of similarity and isomorphism account qualify. So uh, X doesn't rep isn't similar to Y simpliciter. X is similar to Y in some relevant degree or respect. Usually in the similarity literature, that degree or respect is relative to the intentions of a scientist. So more sophisticated recent views employ this notion of uh, the intentions of scientists. Um, isomorphism is way too strong a <laughs> requirement on representations. So people like to call it in French, qualify this with the idea of partial morphism. Um, so I'm gonna take referentialist accounts as kind of my stalking course here. And I'll say a little more uh, about how complicated versions of referentialism might uh, 
uh, account for some of the problems that we're going to talk about. There are also inferentialist views. And what an inferentialist view says is X represents Y if it allows an informed user to draw inferences about Y. Now, as you can tell from my title, this is my preferred account. Uh, so inferentialism was coined early versions by people like Mauricio Suarez. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be dissatisfied with this about with this account as well. So each of these aspects requires more explanation. So why is it that it's about X the inferences aren't allowed to draw? What is it to be an informed user? Uh, why does a particular representation enable particular inferences and not others? I've never felt fully satisfied with this view as it's been developed before. Uh, and lastly, there's a variety of hybrid accounts. Basically, what these do is they split up the denotational part of the representation. So what, uh, what the reference is versus what the representation allows you to do. So this relies on things like interpretation or uh, uh, what Suarez calls deflationary inferentialism. Uh, or friggin' Nguyen's uh, uh, recent denotation exemplification, exemplification, keying up and interpretation, right? I always forget the I. Um, so my view is actually, uh, our view is actually a version of hybrid account. It's got some things in common with these other views, but we, we really stress the inferentialist part. So if you know these views, I'm happy to come back to these later on. Uh, but I want to get on to, to the view that we propose. So uh, this, the general account is one I'm working on uh, with uh, collaborator Mark Povich. And the version of the theory of scientific representationalism that we like is a variety of hybrid account, as I said, but it really uh, uh, leans hard on the inferentialism part. So we call our view Gricean inferentialism. And there's two parts to this. There's the Gricean part. Gricean can mean a lot of different things in philosophy of language. All this means for us is that the reference of a representation is selected intentionally by the scientist. So this echoes Cohen and Callender's 2006 paper, there is no special problem of scientific representation. We agree with that. Uh, we think that reference is uh, relatively uh, intentional and in, in that sense, actually relatively cheap. You know, uh, So I can say the clicker represents the um, uh, USS Enterprise, Right, uh, I can make make that intentional reference by choosing a symbol for that uh, entity. But then there's going to be a wide range of useful or better representations, and then that's going to be determined by whether the use of this representation allows me to draw fruitful and good inferences about the target. So uh, the gracing part is this intentional act of denotation by the scientist. The inferentialist part is what that representation with that denotation allows me to infer. Those are the two aspects of our account. Uh, so in the remainder of this section, I'm gonna focus mostly on the inferentialism because here is the place I think where our account does a lot of work that hasn't been done before in the inf inferentialist sphere. So first off, inferentialism, like inferentialism in the philosophy of language or philosophy of mind, is what's, what Brandon calls a use-based account of semantics. So this means uh, that you put the act of uh, representing prior to the meaning of the representation. So one way to put this is, is to explain the content of the representation as the result of either implicit or explicit dispositions or what we're gonna call conventions for the use of the representation. And as such, we start with an analysis of the act of representing in uh, support collusion uh, with uh, both the Gricean and inferentialist aspects of the account. So here's what we're going to say about representing. Representing is an intentional act of using a particular representation with particular conventions and form to denote particular reference. These aspects together, the referent, the conventions, and the form, determine what we call the inferential set of the representation. And for us, the meaning of the representation is its inferential set. So we constitute the meaning or the content of the representation by the set of inferences that it enables about the chosen system. 
where this is going to be a function, both of the system we've chosen to represent, the nature of the representation and the convention surrounding the use of the representation. Um, just a little bit on form and conventions. This is received relative, if anyone has discussed this in the scientific representation literature, let me know. Maybe it's implicit in some of the discussion, but it's actually quite implicit if you look at, for instance, the cognitive science of using representations to solve problems. So there's a relatively big literature at this point looking at how students versus experts use, for instance, visual diagrams in chemistry to solve chemistry problems. So if you're looking at, for instance, stereochemistry, you might have a variety of questions about the symmetry, the identity, or the uh, chirality of different molecules. And representations like this are very common. And there's a range of, of kind of rules of thumb, conventions for how you can make certain inferences with this model. So for instance, if two of the ligands <laughs> in the molecule are identical, then the model is going to be symmetrical. Uh, and you can actually put people in studies where they, so they solve different problems through different strategies, through rules of thumb, through mental uh, rotation. Uh, you can see how students have particular strategies for solving these problems. And then expert strategies get more complicated and involve multiple strategies as time goes along. So these require mastery of the rules and conventions surrounding the representation. For instance, that uh, these ligands are on the, the basic plane and uh, these ligands are extended in depth one way or another. So there's a certain form in the representation, there's certain conventions for that representation. And the ability to use the representation for a particular task, say solving a problem in organic chemistry, is uh, dependent on the mastery of the form of the conventions. So, uh, but there's of course a ton of representations in say chemistry. So uh, some folks in cognitive science have developed this idea of representational competence, which I think is quite nice. A set of skills and practices that allow a person to reflectively and intentionally use representations uh, to think about chemical phenomena. I think that this representational competence involves mastering conventions in form. And I think that this is something that applies equally to visual representations, to mathematical models, and to computational models. I think this is a process that's involved in all of those forms of representation. Okay, so that's a little bit about convention and form. What do I mean by inferential set? Well, for us, an inferential set comprises three subsets. There's what we call the entailment set. So these are the inferences that are demanded or entailed by the representation. There's what we call the disallowed set. So these are the inferences incompatible with the representation. And then there's, I think, a pretty controversial thing, which we call the importation set. So this is the inferences entailed uh, by the entailment set plus some additional information that the reasoner is bringing to the representation. Uh, I think this is really important because we need it to capture this kind of richness of the practice involved in scientific representation. And a lot of the talk will be relying on that heretofore. Um, so in the paper, we use a kind of very broad metaphor to uh, maps. So if you just look at a roadmap, the entailment set well, so of course the form of the map is a kind of two-dimensional uh, plane with a bunch of figures or uh, icons. The conventions surrounding the use of a roadmap, for instance, involve representing space in the map as space in the world. Uh, or uh, it, this one doesn't have a scale on it, right? But applying the scale listed in the map to that spatial calculation. Uh, and once I know those conventions, I can infer a number of things. So for instance, I mean, Google has done this for you here, but for instance, that the drive from Boston to New York is 538 miles. That's part of the entailment set. That's just entailed by the form and the conventions in the representation. There's also a, a series of things I'm just not allowed to infer from this uh, uh, map. For instance, that going straight north from New York will get me to Boston. If I make that inference on the basis of this map, I have misunderstood the map. I've used the map incorrectly. So I'm not allowed to make that inference on the part of, uh, on, on behalf of this map or, or in conjunction with this map. Now, uh, the importation set is something a little more open-ended. So let's say I'm exactly between New York and Boston on uh, this map. And I say, okay, well, I'm here. I know in virtue of where I am, 
some background knowledge and the map that if I travel a little bit southwest, I'm now closer to good pizza. And if I travel a little bit northeast, I'm now closer to good chowder. Now, this is a toy silly example, but I think it shows the fact that we don't reason with representations purely on their own. We reason with them uh, as part of a set of background knowledge and a, a set of aims, right? So if I really want to get chowder, you know, but I'm all the way down here. Well, then I can say, okay, well, maybe pizza is the way to go. I don't have to drive all the way back. For you. Um, so I think it's very controversial to, uh, and the initial reviews of the paper agree with me, <laughs> 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 to include this in the semantics of the map, right? And you might have a variety of uh, objections to this. It's just too open-ended, right? There's any number of, any amount of background knowledge you can bring to a map. Uh, and you might say, well, there's individual differences. What you know about Boston is going to be different from what I know about Boston. So how can we include all that in the semantics of the map? Um, I actually want to propose that this is an advantage rather than a disadvantage for, for yeah. representing scientific representation. It seems to me these objections miss something really important, namely that a particular representation is employed so as to allow for reasoning about a certain domain about which there's always going to be background knowledge going into reasoning about that domain. So in, in the diagrams paper years ago, we put this as a representation constraining and affording hypothesizing or, or inference about the system. So let's say you find this map randomly on the internet, like I did yesterday. Um, it's pretty clear that this map is designed to be used for a certain kind of purpose, <laughs> right? <laughs> So this map is going to be much more useful to me if I'm a wool merchant in 1912 than it is if I'm a uh, philosophy professor in 2023, although I think it's quite useful to make this point. So, uh, so uh, you know, if, if I'm a wool merchant looking for new contacts, then it's pretty clear I don't want to hang out in this area, right? Uh, where the areas with at least some sheep are much more relevant to my practical, to my practical aims. So that's kind of the, the general point. And then what I'm going to argue in the rest of the talk is that it's really important for understanding how multiple kinds of scientific representations relate to each other and are employed in the course of, for instance, uh, explaining how a system works. So, you know, let's talk about uh, some of this. Different forms of representation are going to have different uh, inferential allowances. Right. So this map is going to allow me to infer things about altitude that neither of these maps is going to allow me to do. That's a result of the form of the topological lines and the conventions for reading those topological lines. Uh, but there are also important differences that are more implicit. So, for instance, on a road map or a hiking map, when two pathways intersect, you can almost always change from one to the other. It's bad if you make that assumption in a subway map. Right. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to use the New York subway, you don't want to make the, the inference that whenever two lines on the map cross, I can always change between those two lines. It's just not true, right? So that's a kind of implicit convention that's important for mastering these different forms of representation. Importantly, going back to my last point, uh, these uh, representations invite bringing certain kinds of background knowledge to them for particular purposes, right? So uh, if I I'm thinking about the amount of gas in my car, right, and its relevance to my traveling around, then this is not really relevant to me at all, right? Amount of gas in the car is just not really relevant for thinking about this map, whereas it's very relevant for thinking about the highway map. And it might be relevant for like a tiny bit of the hiking map, but not very much. Right? Um, how, how badly sprained my ankle is is really relevant when I'm reasoning with the hiking map, not so much for the subway map. Um, you know, the condition of my boots, you know, all these, all these stuff, all this stuff you can think about. So the idea behind the importation set is that it's open-ended, but not completely so. The form and conventions of the representation constrain the kinds of background knowledge and the kinds of applications to that you can bring to the representation and therefore use uh, with the representation. 
So the analogy here is that we kind of locate ourselves counterfactually in a representation. So if I if I know that I'm here, that's going to shape my my reasoning and all the background knowledge that I bring to it, um, and use the inferential set to kind of navigate around the representation to think about uh, the outcomes of certain kinds of counterfactual situations in the representation. Uh, Von Frossen makes a similar analogy, I think, in his 2008 book. So that's the general picture. What we do in the paper, and I'm not going to do this in any depth, uh, is to go through a variety of kind of simple cases of types of models and then applied cases. Um, so this is a, a kind of simple causal model. Uh, you, both these examples draw on Jim and Clark Gleamore's work. Um, so if this is the uh, if this is the presence of fire, this is a short circuit, and this is oxygen, right? The conventions uh, allow me to infer that the presence of both uh, short circuit and oxygen is sufficient for fire, but I can't interpret these arrows in terms of causal sufficiency. So I can't just infer that the presence of oxygen is um, uh, sufficient for fire. Uh, similarly, I you know I can bring back out big, bring background knowledge to that. So if I I know that oxygen is the element isolated by Priestley, then I can uh, infer that a short circuit plus the element uh, isolated by Priestley is sufficient for fire. Uh, this is an example of uh, linguistic aphasia. So this is supposed to represent the brain area involved in sound recognition. And an interruption in this area will cause effects both on higher level language understanding and on the production of language. So I, that's kind of entailed by the understanding of the model, but I'm disallowed from inferring in the opposite direction. And I might infer, for instance, if I know that the superior temporal gyrus is the area involved in, in uh, uh, sound recognition, then I can infer that an interruption to the superior temporal gyrus will result in these specific forms of aphasia. Um, another example we use is network models. So network models represent a system as a series of nodes and edges. So uh, each node is an entity and each edge is a connection between entities of some sort. There are a variety of conventions and measurements involved in network representation. For instance, one is what we can call a hub measurement. So there's a variety of these, but the simplest one is just a node with a lot of connections. And from knowing that something is a hub, you can make a variety of inferences about it. So uh, you can use this to say model airport networks. And if I know that, for instance, Chicago is a hub, I know that I'm much more likely to get across country by stopping in Chicago than I am in New Orleans. So much the worse for me, right? Um, but I also know, uh, you know, if I know that there's a, a, a good deep dish restaurant in the Chicago airport, I know that I'm going to be likely to be able to get deep dish pizza in my um, uh, trip across country. Here's an example of looking at brain networks, specifically in the case of schizophrenia. So all of these dots are parts of the brain that have a high degree. So they're all hub nodes in the brain. And the blue ones are ones that have a lower degree of connectivity in patients with schizophrenia. So in this case, this shows that there's a significant, this entails that there's a significant difference between in the hub connectivity in the brain in uh, control patients and patients with schizophrenia. Similarly, if I know or hypothesize that what hub units do is integrate information across domains, now I can infer that there's a problem with integration across domains in the case of, schi of schizophrenia. So again, the, the, the form and conventions surrounding these representations constrain and invite certain kinds of reasoning about the system. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this case because of course already running long a little bit. So, Advantages. Our account, I think, does the best job, or accounts like our account, do the best job of thinking about idealization and abstraction. Why is that? Well, because we don't make a particular relationship of similarity or isomorphism constitutive of the representation relation, right? So any amount of disconnect between the system and the representation is compatible with our view because the representation, the reference is intentional and not based on this uh, substantive relationship. We think we have a great account of the problem of style. 
Differences in representational and style and use correspond to differences in the inferential sets of the respective representations. So we employ this type of representation in this context because it affords the kind of uh, inferences we want. And we employ this other one in this other context because it, uh, it uh, affords the kind of inferences we want in this context. Just want to point out this doesn't mean that similarity and morphism can never be good making uh, aspects of representation. There are, for instance, one way in which good inferences might be allowed. They're just not constitutive of representation on our account. Okay. So um, that's kind of the general overview. I, I went through that a little quickly, largely because uh, this paper's already writ written and the things I'm gonna be writing over the next couple of weeks are applications of the account. So I'm excited about the applications and I wanna, and I wanna get into them a little bit. Hopefully the applications will also make clear what the uh, explanatory benefits of the account are. So the cases I'm gonna talk about are in employing representations for explanation. So I take a broadly pragmatic view of explanation here. So we uh, want to explain how a system does what it does, why it does what it does, in what circumstances it does what it does. And I'm gonna think about uh, the way that inferentialism relates with these kinds of explanatory projects. So I've got two case studies. I what we'll see if I get through all it all, but we'll see. Um, so here's an argument against these referentialist accounts. So remember, reference uh, defines the content of a representation by its referential relationship to what it represents. I think there's a, an unnoticed corollary to these views, and that is that if content enables explanation then explanatory differences should mirror referential differences, right? So if the referential relationship defines the content, then anytime there's an uh, a difference in explanation related to that content, it must mirror some difference in the referential properties of the representations. So what I call the problem of representational overlap comes from an observation about the use of representations <laughs> that very often you've got the same set of entities and relations in the system. You've got different representations with different explanatory roles that refer equally by either similarity or isomorphism to those elements, but their explanatory roles differ. And if this is the case, then, re then referentialist views just can't explain this explanatory difference because on their view, the content is the uh, referential relationship. So same referent, different explanatory role causes a problem for referentialist views, at least if they want to use the, the meaning of the representation to explain how the representation contributes to explanation. Here's the problem with these projects. Uh, they're based on like really detailed case studies using multiple models in systems biology and systems neuroscience. Um, doesn't lend itself very easily to like four minute posited uh, versions. So I'm going to I'm going to go through these case studies because I think it's um, that looking at the case studies really brings out some of this representational complexity and 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 practical complexity that I talked about. I don't expect you to follow every detail. What I want you to try to follow is just kind of the logic of when a particular form of representation gets employed for what use. Um, so the first case study I look at is a study from uh, mammalian chronobiology or circadian biology. Yeah. So chronobiologists study biological clocks. We have, as part of that grant project, we had a philosophy lab in the Center for Circadian Biology at UCSD. It was very cute. Um, and what uh, biological clocks do is they pr produce endogenous timing signals. So when they're appropriately rigged up, these can, these can take place on roughly 24 hour uh, cycles. And this is important for a wide variety of reasons. Largely, they allow the organism to anticipate environmental changes. So if I'm a bat and all the bugs come out at uh, you know, 6 a.m., it's really good if I wake up at 5 prior to 6 a.m., right? Um, so in mammals, there's a range of clock me mechanisms at a, at a variety of levels of organization. Uh, I'm only going to be looking at intracellular timekeeping mechanisms. So even within individual cells, there are circadian rhythms. 
uh, these rhythms in, uh, regulate things, for instance, like gene expression and metabolism within the cell. But when you think about it, that's, that's a kind of a crazy thing. How does an individual cell with very uh, dynamically short time scale involving biological and chemical interactions produce a signal at the scale of 24 hours? It's actually a really incredible biological problem that these systems have solved. Um, and the standard account for a long time, still part of the account, was that this involves a kind of principle of uh, delayed negative feedback. So basically the idea here is you've got this kind of core system, this one right here. And what happens here is these uh, proteins, BMAL1 and CLOCK, bind to promoter regions on these genes, period, and cryptochrome. These genes uh, are uh, transcribed, translated outside of the nucleus. They dimerize, translocate back inside the nucleus and interrupt their own uh, transcription. So this is uh, negative, negative uh, delayed negative self-feedback. And if you, you know, time all the reactions right, you can actually get a process like this to run over a 24 hour cycle. Uh, of course, it's more complicated than that because BML1 and CLOCK are also on their own cycle. This is called the positive loop. Uh, that keeps their regulation of this cycle in time. So this was the understanding roughly in 2005. And then people started using these high throughput interaction techniques to look at all the things that were actually interacting with this system. And you end up with that. <laughs> so I think, you know, the appropriate reaction to this is like, oh God. Um, so one of the things that happened in the late 2000s was a series of projects in systems biology that were designed to make sense of some of this complexity. So here's basically how this works. The idea here is that you're gonna get lost if you just focus on all these proteins and genes and interactions. There must be some other design principle at work. And the idea that Ueda et al. had, et al. Et al. had was to stop thinking about the individual proteins and such, and instead to think about the promoter regions. So what they notice is that there are a couple of promoter regions that are uh, on, that are shared across these genes. So these many genes that are regulated by and interact with the circadian system, they sh they all have some combination of these promoter regions. So the thought was, well, maybe it's activity at the promoter regions that's really organizing this whole system. So here, this is a reconceptualization of all that genetic and protein complexity as being organized to regulate temporal sequences at the promoter regions. And it turns out you can test this. So uh, fun molecular biology technique, you can attach a, a bioluminescent reporter to be under control of the promoter region so that when the promoter region is active, you get a nice bioluminescent signal and you can track the evolution of that signal over time. Um, it's a little hard to see in this graph, but what this is, is a, a graph of peak activation levels at the EBOX promoter across all the genes on which the EBOX occurs. And what you see is there's a very clear synchronicity across all of those genes, uh, genes of peak activation of the EBOX promoter in the morning. They showed a similar thing for what's for this DBOX promoter in the afternoon and, and a similar thing for the this RRE promoter uh, in the evening. So now you've got kind of a nice daily layout of a cycle, right? But of course, they weren't just happy. That's like a nice correlational thing. Um, they also noticed this anomaly that uh, this protein was way out of whack temporally to uh, what it should be compared to the rest of the EBOX genes. So I'll come back to that. So what they did actually then was they went into the synthetic biology laboratory and they were like, can we rig up a system that mimics just those elements of the more complex system and generates the phenomenon? So they, they rigged up mimics of the three promoter regions and then got rid of all that overlap between the genes, just rigged up uh, an activator and repressor protein uh, and uh, engineered to be activated by those promoters. And they showed that you could get very precise timings of when all of those D boxes were activated. If you have repressors coming from the RRE and activators coming from the, the E box, these activators then will be proteins uh, that are produced by the genes under control of the promoters. And they showed that you can generate a 24 hour rhythm just with these components. 
So I think that's pretty awesome. But they weren't happy there. They formulated what they, a mathematical model they call a phase vector model. And what this model does is basically models the peak uh, phase and amplitude of a particular promoter activation or protein quantity as a function of the peak phase and amplitude of its repressors and the peak phase and amplitude of its uh, repressors. And it turns out you can generate a huge amount of predictions for when something is being regulated by certain other entities just on the basis of having this mathematical model of, uh, so this is like hours in the day, right? And uh, the so for instance, the arrow represents the peak time in hours of the day on a 24 hour circle. And the, the quantity, the normalized quantity of the activation of whatever that unit is. But they weren't happy there. They said, what about this anomaly of this protein that's so out of whack with regards to other EBOX proteins? So they actually went in and did some, some gene sequencing, and they found what had been missed in previous chemical analyses of this gene, that it that CRY1, in addition to having the EBOX that they knew about, also has a repetition of the other promoter. So it also has a, a, a DBOX and an RRE on it. That's what explains and you can use the phase vector model to explain exactly why it has that different period uh, with regards to, sorry, different phase with the other, with regards to the other proteins. But they weren't happy there. So what they did is they took a lot of these temporal and causal relationships that they model and they said, well, what, what is the causal structure uh, underlying this system? And they said, okay, well, if we look at the combination of repressors and activators, we can think of this as uh, two network motifs. One, uh, the, the standard delayed feedback uh, tech, uh, motif, where this activates this, activates this, represses this. And what's called a repressor later, where every entity represses every other entity. And the idea is that specifically this CRY1 protein plays this role in keeping these two motifs synced up temporally. So they tested this by just intervening on the CRY1 protein really specifically to knock its uh, phase a little forward or a little back. And they showed that even fine degree phases in the uh, protein quantities, sorry, fine degree shifts in phase in the protein quantities totally interrupt this biological rhythm. Okay, forget all that. <laughs> Here's the story. Um, each of these representations allows for different inferences to be made about the same system. So the data graphs allow you to uh, infer particular temporal relationships, for instance, that all the e-boxes are in base. The synthetic biology models allow you to have a kind of modal sufficiency. These three entities rigged up in this arrangement are sufficient to produce a 24-hour rhythm. The phase vector models allow for fine-grained temporal and quantitative prediction. The sequencing diagram reveals the molecular structure, and the network diagram reveals the overall causal structure of the system. None of these can do the other's jobs. The idea is that the inferential set of each representation is what explains these different explanatory roles in understanding this complex system. But importantly, they all refer to the same stuff. They all refer to the promoters, the activators, the uh, mechanisms underlying those activation and repression relationships at the G promoters and the temporal relationships that they produce. There's a huge amount of overlap in what all of these models refer to, but they all play different explanatory roles. So it's an instantiation, as I read it, of this problem of representational overlap. Now, let's say you're a diehard similarity person, just to take an example. Um, one thing you can do is say, okay, well, sure. I mean, they all refer to the same entities and stuff, but they're like different. This one has more fine grain content. This one refers more explicitly to temporal relationships. And in this, it's more implicit. Um, so you, you might want to adopt this, what I very uncharitably call a pick and choose strategy. But I think this is actually quite present amongst people who think about similarity. So in this old quote from Gary, he says, well, you know, we have to wait for it all to work out. And once we figure out that these models are good, we can say, well, okay, this model must be similar in the relevant respects to the target. Um, I've got a ton of problems with this. I think it's ineluctably post hoc. 
So it can only kind of backwards infer from the end of expl explanation to some kind of similarity. Can't explain why and how the internal mechanisms of that explanation work. I think representational overlap is just as important as any potential difference, right? So when I'm representing the temporal, the fine-grained temporal patterns, I'm representing the fine-grained temporal patterns of those particular mechanisms interacting in this particular way. It's very important that I be representing the same stuff with the temporal relationships as I am with the molecular geometry, for instance. And in many cases, dissimilarity is just as important as similarity. So we want the synthetic biology model to mirror or refer to the, the promoter regions that we think are present in the system, but its simplicity compared to that system is what allows for that kind of modal understanding of sufficiency. So I don't think even a more sophisticated similarity account will capture this, uh, and I feel the same way about um, isomorphism accounts, although I won't go through that. Got 10 minutes. You ready for another one? Everybody yeah. geared up for more of this? Yeah. Um, thanks for that very half hearted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <but it> was <laughs> real. Um, look, this is what happens when you like do studies in like philosophy of science and practice, it just gets complicated. Um, so, what I really wanted to get to, largely because Sandy said she um, very, very kindly. Um, is the relationship between explanation and pluralism. And I think our account has some resources to illuminate this relationship. So uh, I think you can tell from the previous study that certainly instances in biology are uh, what I call representationally rich. An individual research project employs many different forms of representations. Those plots I just showed, those examples I showed you were just examples. Every paper has like five to eight of figures of that type, right, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the paper. Um, so what you might look at, oh, well, look at all this diversity in representations and models. We, this might suggest a kind of pluralism about explanation. But which kind? There's a kind of pluralism that I don't like, and there's a kind of pluralism that I do like. Hint, Sandy's version is the version that I like. <laughs> so I contrast what Sandy calls integrative pluralism with what I call division of labor pluralism. So this is the idea that a complex system has many different features and many different types of behaviors. For each feature or type of behavior, there's a kind of model or representation that explains that feature. So when you want to go to understand the system, you divide the system up into all its different features and explanata. You pick the right model or representation for that bit, and that model explains that bit. Um, in its extremes, this suggests that different kinds of models don't have to talk to each other at all. Uh, and I think there are a lot of people who actually endorse this view. So if you look at things like network features or network phenomena, uh, people like Philip Kuhneman, uh, Michael Silberstein argue that when you talk about these kinds of system features, uh, uh, a network topology explains and not other kinds of models. Uh, if you look at things like scales, subsystems, and causal patterns, people like uh, Longino and Angelo Tatoshnik suggest that for different kinds of phenomena, different kinds of causal patterns in the system, you can have different kinds of models. Each kind of model is appropriate to that kind of pattern, and you get this kind of division of labor between in, in, in the explanation. Uh, just to note that these kinds of uh, in intuitions or inclinations are employed all over the place in debates in philosophy of science about the scope and uh, and limits of mechanistic explanation, about emergence and reduction, and about causal versus non-causal explanation. I'm not going to go into those here. But anyway, the, the version I prefer is, uh, oh, we started at 12, at 12.05. I've got 10 minutes. That's great. No one complains if you actually cut five minutes off. <laughs> it's never happened that they've complained, but it's also never happened that I've done it. <laughs> okay. Um, so the version I prefer, um, I, I got into uh, by reading Sandy's first book a number of years ago, and that's integrative pluralism. So basically the idea here is that different models or representations work together in an important way to explain different aspects of complex systems. So it's not like you just divide the whole system up and each one works on their own. There's an important kind of interaction that uh, needs to go on between different models or um, representations. And this working together is called integration. And 
the way Sandy puts this in the book is against a variety of other pluralisms uh, based on levels of organization or particular kinds of explanatory questions or uh, uh, ideas that models are competing against each other. So I take this to basically be what I've called a division of labor kind of pluralism. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, Sandy argues that uh, these kinds of views fail to represent the important relationships between alternative explanations or models. And I've always thought that's entirely, completely correct. Um, the question I've always had is exactly what constitutes successful integration, though. So how do I take two things and integrate them? When, when do I know that I've done that sufficiently or correctly? Um, so uh, again, Sandy uh, talks about integration in a number of ways, explanation of, a right of combinations of causal factors, explanation across levels, uh, explanation that captures all of the relevant features of the phenomenon, and explanation involving uh, different types of representations or models, or more recently, research methods and perspectives, right? Um, so uh, I think that's all right. As someone who's interested in representation, I've always wondered, like, what exactly is it for two representations or models to be integrated vis-a-vis -vis each other? And I think if you embrace our version of inferentialism, you actually have a nice account of that. So I'm going to say that representations A and B are integrated if both A and B denote system S. And if the entailment set of one representation contains inferences that are in the importation set of the other representation. So remember, the importation set is when you're bringing extra content to use with, with a model or representation. And the idea here is that you integrate representations when you intentionally uh, use the, the entailment set of this representation to fill in or contribute to the importation set in this representation and now you get a broader entailment set from the combined representations. That's the view. So uh, let's say you take a set of explananda pertaining to system X. So I will say that an integrated pluralist explanation is one in which uh, X1 to Xn are in the conjoined entailment sets of representations R1 to Rn, where R1 to Rn are integrated in the sense that I just gave above. And the prediction, which is amply evidenced in this next case study that I'm not going to have time to go through, is that representations should be constructed to make explicit something that is compatible with but not explicit in, in previous representations. Um, so, Let me let me uh, let me do this really quickly. Uh, so this is just a quote from Michael Silverstein, evidencing division of labor pluralism in network neuroscience, which is the case that I'm looking at. So Silverstein thinks that the division of labor model is right. I think that's wrong. I think the integrative model is right. And we're looking at these. Uh, so these are network representations like the ones I gave earlier in the airport case. Um, but I'm looking at a specific topological feature called the Rich Club. And basically, the Rich Club is based on this idea that um, uh, highly influential people are likely to be interacting with each other. So the idea in a network is that nodes with a really high degree, nodes that have a lot of connections to other nodes, are themselves highly connected. So there's uh, formal measurements uh, involving a Rich Club coefficient, but that's basically the idea. You have a Rich Club when the highest degree nodes in a network are also really highly connected to each other. Turns out this is a really general feature of a lot of uh, a lot of um, systems. It allows for two things. It allows for efficiency and robustness. So any information that goes through the Rich Club can get from any one part of the network to any other quickly. But also, uh, it allows for for gradual functional loss if one of the networks is knocked out. Right. So uh, you know, even if I can't get to Charlotte from uh, from New Orleans, I can get to Chicago and then I can get somewhere close to Charlotte, right? So what neuroscientists have done is they have looked at the brain, looked at network measurements in the brain, where this is where one part of the brain, its degree is its con connectivity to other parts of the brain, and asked if there's a rich club. 
And there is. And they've gone and measured uh, these uh, aspects of efficiency and robustness, right? So what they've shown through simulation, so they've shown A, that the, the cortical network involves a bridge club. And then they've shown through simulation that um, if you attach a node in a rich club unit, it has less of an effect on network efficiency and uh, than attack on a rich club node. And that rich club networks are overall more immune to interruptions than other than random networks, for instance. So they show these properties of efficiency and robustness in the rich club. Oh, there's no citation here. Ew. Uh, Sporns and Van den Hoogle, early paper 2011. Um, I'm going to skip this example, which is a shame because I wanted to talk about how when you think about evolutionary constraints, you really want to think about how this kind of network topology would emerge in a spatially constrained system like the brain, and therefore you need the rich club in space. <laughs> um, but I'm going to, I'm going to skip it. <laughs> um, the cases I'm going to talk about really quickly are networks and dynamics and networks and function. So uh, we don't want to just want to know that the rich club is there. We want to know what allows the brain to do. So in this uh, study in 2014, uh, Sendin and Al combined a rich club topology that they took from the brain with a spin glass model of dynamics. So basically, this is kind of a, a version of icing model. And basically what this does is it captures dynamics quite a, in a quite idealized way in either a set of up or down states where the state is determined by the uh, uh, connectivity by the active by the state of the node at a time, and then at time t plus one, it's that state plus its connectivity to other states in their um, uh, activation state. And what you can do with this is you can model a rich club where each node is a spin unit, right? So its dynamics are evolving uh, according to the spin model. But remember, you've taken the organization from the brain network. Uh, and then you can ask, well, what can this network do? And they came up with a model of what they call entropy, where entropy is just a model of the functional diversity of the system. So how many different functionally stable states can the network get into? Uh, and they showed, again, that a rich club structure has a much greater functional diversity than a non-rich club structure, even if uh, the network involves hubs, the comparative network. Um, but they weren't satisfied there. So you also want to know, so we've been looking at these abstract properties of networks, but we also want to know how this lets us do like particular stuff. So what they did is they took fMRI measurements from the cortical network while subjects were performing a range of tasks and compared those tasks to rest. And what they did is they, uh, they developed what they called a dynamical causal model that infers from temporal correlations, sequence temporal correlations between, say, node A and node B, a direction of causality between node A and node B. And what they showed is something quite interesting that these rich club units have a lot of information coming in during rest. So they're getting information from all over the brain during rest. But when you switch from rest to a particular task, that switches, and now they're exerting more influence on the rest of the network. So the idea here is that this, um, uh, the rich club is taking in information about task context, and in a particular task context, it enforces a set of more task-specific network arrangements on the remainder of the network. Again, the, the details aren't uh, important. Uh, but I, but the, this, I, I just want to argue that this captures or this exemplifies the kind of structure I just mentioned, right? So uh, here's the account of integration. So I think the rich club model entails things about inferences about network structure. That's kind of obvious. That's what it does. But it's just agnostic about the temporal dynamics or the particular causal pathways involved in particular functional situations, just agnostic about those things. Well, what I can do is take that same topological structure develop a model that in my terminology integrates with it. So it fills in uh, some explicit content to the importation set of the other model. And it makes explicit inferences about state space or uh, attractor a space basically of the network. 
Neither of those entail specific anything about causal directionality or, or temporal relations, uh, well, I guess temporal in the, in the dynamic model, um, but neither of those entails anything about directionality or causal relationships in the system. And that's what the development of the uh, dynamic causal model allows them to impart onto this network in particular situations. So uh, I think that this captures the kind of thing uh, that Sandy says in this 2017 paper, where multiple adequate models should be and in fact are related by integration, even though they're not intertranslatable or reducible. Like these aren't the same model, they're different models, but they need to be employed in conjunction with each other and the accounts of integration that I want to uh, propose tries to capture them. Thanks. <laughs> One of five on the dot, I just want to say. <laughs> okay, so we'll follow the usual practice. Take some break. He doesn't trust me to run the question time. This event will. I should introduce you.